I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast. Thanks so much for joining yet again. And I am very honored and pleased yet again to be joined by two priests who have never been on the show before. So it's it's a, always a pleasure for me to bring on different priests from, from around the world, um, Father Sanquist and Father Saunders. Father Saunders is in Canada, and Father Sanquist is now in Iowa and Omaha, I think primarily in, in Iowa. Um, and we're going to talk today about... I think an interesting topic, the idea of having grown up as a traditional Catholic in the 1990s and 2000s, I suppose. And we thought of this idea when I, I had a podcast with Father Benedict Hughes, where we talked about the CMRI, and he brought up the topic of maybe talking about being having been raised as a Catholic in the 1960s and 70s, which I think is a fantastic topic and a great chat I think that we can have with Father Benedict and, and to, to see their struggles and what they went through and and how it was to have been around at that time but I think it's also a nice thing to, to juxtapose that with a with a show with two younger priests who grew up now more in the 1990s and 2000s and 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 didn't have the same experience as their parents or grandparents and 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 also to talk about how we as Catholics now and then are normal people we're not these 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 crazy cultists or anything. As we lose Father Sanquist, he'll be back. <laughs> um, it, we're not these crazy people. We're, we're, it's, there's nothing strange about us. We we had normal childhoods. We we've had pretty normal lives. And I think that's kind of what we want to talk about to show people that that it, it sounds extreme. Our position as as state of a contest sounds like this kind of who are these guys? Yeah, we're 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 normal people and, and normal priests, and we were normal kids who I think in general had very nice normal childhoods and that's what we're going to talk about today and i think to start off we're going to send it over to father saunders to maybe give a brief description of of who you are father and and, and where you're from sure yeah so thanks for having us on i think it's a, a great topic really interesting um yeah so i'm i'm in london ontario which is near the southern tip of canada actually south of a good chunk of the us to many people's surprise uh, but I've lived in this area my whole life, so I'm in my in my home area. I've actually lived an hour from here for most of my life, aside aside from my time away studying. Uh, we grew up. We were a you know, Catholic background, Irish and Belgium primarily is our my Catholic heritage. And uh, you know, my uncle, my great uncle, is a, actually a priest in the diocese here, diocese of London. He was ordained five minutes from where I am, down in the basilica, the cathedral. Um, his sister was a nun. She worked, you know, she in the local. The nuns around here, sisters of St. Joseph, back years ago, and their cousin was a nun. My, my grandmother's heavily involved in Catholic stuff. So it was a Catholic family. They were very much part of the Catholic world two generations ago. Um, and then, of course, things be as they are in the world, etc. We grew up going to church. We went to church every Sunday in, in the Nervous Ordo until I was nine years old. Uh, my, so my mother was a widow. So my father died when I was two years old. And at that time, she met a gentleman who was going to the traditional mass, who said the contest, and he introduced her to kind of the ideas. And she knew something was off in the Novus Ordo, you know, in church. She knew something was not quite right. She had seen things that were, eh. and when he explained the situation to her, she said, okay, for a while, she thought about it. She kind of went to both for a while and then said, yeah, okay, that's, uh, this is what we have to do. So I was lucky enough to come in at nine years old. I was the youngest of five. So some of our siblings right away became traditional, some kind of variants of reactions, but me being young enough, I just came right in and was privileged to get a Catholic education from that point on, pretty, a pretty thorough Catholic education. Now at that, at that point, we were, uh, it was mass once a month in the upstairs of a woman's house you know, on a farm. So it was definitely unique, definitely unique, but uh, I learned an appreciation for the mass there. Mass once a month, and then the other Sundays of the month, we would get together with another family at the chapel uh, the, the woman had there and maybe a couple other people and we would do a holy hour every week that we didn't have the mass and at that time we were with some clergy who were since passed away uh, but they not the same right actually some other traditional set of the countess clergy and they're both since passed away but i learned learned a lot from them uh, father you know some priests would come up from the states and so that was kind of my early on experience and then uh through a whole series of events i ended up in the same right seminary with a, <laughs> summarize a whole bunch of years there and here i am today back pastor for some of my family so interesting that that is that's a whole topic in itself i i also <laughs> my, my my parish priest here father heine is also his family 
priest. And I, I think that it's a really interesting thing that, that I'm sure it brings its its joys and its struggles, which I'm sure people can only imagine <laughs> that you have the, the closeness, which is good. And then you have the closeness, which is also probably bad, <laughs> so I guess, win and lose. And, and Father, I wanted to ask you, do you, do you have memories of, of the Nova Sordo then? You, you must remember a bit about how that was. Uh, the one that distinctly stands out is uh, my mother telling us to stop playing with our shoes in church. <laughs> but but um, I do I do have memories now. Interestingly, my uncle was actually my pastor for the, the time that I remember. So that would have been you know maybe seven eight years old, uh, and I, I took an interest in the priesthood right from that point, and uh, we got along with him very well. So I don't have a lot of memories from the. From the Nervous Ordo, nothing really outstanding. Or, you know, we're in a country parish, Our Lady Last Lap, beautiful, beautiful church. Um, but there's not really a lot that stands out there. For so me. it was it was a fairly conservative parish. I don't know, but it definitely yeah. there's definitely no clown masses going on. We okay. we had a, I do recall we had a um and this more from you know I wasn't paying attention to this when I was that age, but speaking to my mother, uh, the priest we had for a good number of years was older and he was def definitively conservative. So we definitely okay. had that aspect there, but we weren't, you know, aside from my uncle, we weren't involved in parish life that I remembered. You know, I didn't really know the clergy really well or anything. We would go to church on Sundays, but other than that, it wasn't a huge part of life. So, Got it. yeah. Interesting. And Father Sanquist, I guess that's a good time to send it over to you. I mean, you, I, I have to say, this is one of, one of my best bragging rights of all time. Father Sanquist is a priest. For, for what almost four years now or, or approaching four years and I, I taught him how to serve mass at least i was one of his teachers i wasn't the only one but i was one of them so yeah, yeah i guess uh i don't know i must have must have done something right there <laughs> so, father sanquist are you going to give us a little a little history of yourself and where you're from yes thank you kevin i appreciate you having me on the show and uh i'm a listener you should listen on the uh when I'm traveling down to Oklahoma and back. <clears throat> and I was actually going to mention that, but you beat me to the punch that Kevin taught me to serve when I was just eight years old. Yeah, he was a border boy in Omaha. And uh, I think him and Father Borja kind of uh, would go back and forth, but I think um, between the two of them, you know, they helped get me how to serve. And, and uh, so you, you very had much to bring up Father Borja. You had to bring up Father Borja, so no, no, no one's going to believe that it was my responsibility. Thanks, thanks a lot, Father. <laughs> but you're right. Sorry, man. You got to give credit. Yeah, it that's true. It's true. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, I grew up in Omaha. I was a cradle Catholic. Uh, my parents attended some of the first lectures that were given by His Excellency in in. It was either Columbus or Omaha, and um, from there, I think there was a group of about 30 individuals who who were like, okay, well, where do we go next? I mean, they were ready to leave the Nova Sordo. My dad was a convert from Protestantism, but he he noticed that it was not much different than, than the Protestant church, uh, the Nova Sordo church, that is. My mother, she grew up Nova Sordo. Um, and so from there, he, it was actually my dad that kind of took that a step further in, and, uh, they looked a little more into it and then they found out there was a, a lecture being held. So they went to that and, and, um, from there, <clears throat> like I said, they had a group of about 30 souls that started what was a mission here in Omaha. My father was actually like kind of the kind of led the way in, in building the church as we know it today in, in Omaha. Um, so that was late eighties, early nineties, I think is when all that uh, took place in Omaha. I was born ninety five, so this was all uh, you know, they were already converted. I was uh, grew up Catholic my whole life and attended the school there from kindergarten through twelfth. So really had, like Kevin said, a normal, a normal uh, life, have, have uh, 10 siblings. So the second youngest of 11 and uh, we had nine boys and two girls. So there was a lot of 
a lot of house and tackle football and whatever, you name it. Uh, we had a lot of fun growing up with a big family. And, and that's, I think when you can relate, there's a lot of uh, joy attached to, you know, um, family, a lot of uh, different activities going on. There's never a dolment in a, in a large household like that. But, um, so, so I guess basic attended the school there, was taught by the sisters um, up until high school. In fact, Kevin, you, you actually taught uh you taught me geography class as well i, I did so yep. i did and yeah, then and and, and, I, and i and i i won't comment on on how what type of a student you were <laughs> oh the top of the class i mean bar none right <laughs> oh a little yeah. distracting at times but and, and actually I, I gotta tell another story about father Tanquis when father father must have been i don't know 10 years old or so and and i, I was walking down the sidewalk in omaha and, and i see father Stephen at the time, obviously swinging on a branch, uh, like off, it's jumping off, I think off the fence or something and swinging on a tree branch. And I was like, Stephen, you, I, I, you better stop that. You're going to break your arm. And I, I left and uh, I came back and the next day, the next day he comes into class with a, with a broken arm. <laughs> yeah. Right. You, you broke, it was, you broke your arm swinging on that. Right. Yeah. I did. I, I fractured yeah. my arm. And I, growing up, I used to write stuff in journals. I mean, it was just notebooks. I would write down stories. And, and I wrote that. I wrote that story down. Kevin told me not to swing on it. I should have thanked him and listened to him, but I didn't. And I disobeyed. That's awesome. <laughs> but I broke That's my... awesome. Oh, man. Yeah, see? Should have listened. So, you should have listened. I, I, see, yeah. anyone listening to this, see? If, if I ever give you advice, it's probably right. I mean, Father, <laughs> Sanquist, Father Sanquist can attest to that. <laughs> And so, Father yep. was I'd ask you first, wh when did you find, when did you have the calling or, or when did you think it might be possible that you may become a priest? So, my path was not clear cut and dry, but I will say, um, starting about sixth, seventh, eighth grade, around there, I started to develop a deeper appreciation for my faith. I think, I think that's, I mean, quite you as you're getting older um and started going to daily mass with my mom even though you know she would get up early, you know she would get home late at night and she just gave us that example uh you know she would get home 11 o'clock and we have a seven o'clock morning mass uh, in omaha she would always go to mass come back and then pick us up she didn't make us go but by that example i think inspired me to uh, with her. And so starting about seventh, eighth grade, um, I think just the extra grace from the, the immense daily mass was a huge help. Also, um, throughout high school, I always had a, a great respect for the seminarians and just joining in on choir practices, recreation. I mean, back when it was in Omaha at the church there, and I even had a job during high school. The first thing I would do when I get off work, would go straight to the church and, and join in on choir practice or, you know, if they're playing street soccer in the lot. Uh, just always love to spend time with the seminarians because, um, you know, I just love that that good example, that good camaraderie that they had. And, you know, I think those two, I think, are uh, important obviously it's god's grace uh you know calling individuals and like i said it was never clear cut and dry say another uh aspect is the fact that growing up always had this uh thought in my mind kind of like what do i want to do as a career and i kept coming back to like well, basically, the only thing I like to—I want to have—I want to do something that has value. And uh, whenever I thought of, could I be a nurse, or could I be, you know, um, some other occupation, a carpenter? It just never—it never clicked for me. I mean, I know those are means to an end. You're supporting a family. You know, we have to have good Catholic families, but 
I just, it never seemed satisfying for me. And um, I remember from waking up Saturday mornings, you know, six o'clock to go to work. Anytime you have to wake up to go to work, it's just miserable. And I remember just joining the seminary. And even though we have to wake up at, you know, six o'clock or whatever, it's like, I get to wake up to go pray. Like, this is awesome. I mean, it's, it's your job, but there's so much like, like joy and, and um, there's value there. So that was something, um, a mixture of those different uh, factors. Um, and kind of in a nutshell, those, th that would be um, the reasons, I guess. God's grace ultimately uh, is what leads us all to our vocations. But Well, and you're, as you say, a really good example, too, of someone who was blessed to be around the religious. I, I think that's such a good point. And it's something that, that I obviously experienced for my few years, not, not as long as you, but my years in Omaha, that, that you, you have to be affected by it. You know I mean? I mean, that's something that we'll talk about a bit. I want to ask father Saunders about his, his journey a bit here too, but, but to talk about that, you know, the, there's so much of, if you talk to people in the world, I've heard so many times people with, with stories about you know nuns you know spanking them or, or something like that you, know, you hear these things all the time and and i i think most of them unfortunately are just made up you know the, the people hear them in hollywood they hear these you know these stories and then they they just happen to have had the same things I, i've heard it from several people who had these apparently happened to them when when they were kids and i don't know i guess i can't say for sure it happened or not but my experiences with with the religious all of them, all of, I mean, in five years I spent in Omaha, we're all positive. I, I never had any negative experiences unless it was from my, for myself, from my own mistakes, from doing something stupid and I got in trouble. Yeah. I mean, obviously, but, but, you know, I, I think that's a really good point that, that as we see the growth of the religious, you know, and, and, and more sisters and more priests and more seminarians, it grows exponentially because just others being able to be around them and to experience that it, it, it helps them to see, Hey, this is a vocation that might be for me, that this might be something, as Father Sanko said, it might be exciting and it might be, I don't know, fun is the word, but but something that is doable and something that is that is higher than most, that the higher than all vocations. But 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 Father Saunders, I'd love to ask you too, because because I think you must have had a, a slightly different trip. And, and you said your uncle was a priest, and so you had thought about it when you were young. But how how did you what was the decision there, I guess, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, well it's uh Kind of a hard one to put my finger on, actually. Like, Father, I was about 13, I would say, when I decided I wanted to be a priest, maybe a little more definite. And uh, for me, for whatever reason, you know, God, I had that interest when I was young. You know, when, I was, when, I was, when my uncle was my pastor, I wasn't really thinking what I was going to do for life. He's talking seven, eight years old. But uh, I definitely had an interest there. Um, but, yeah, from I, I, I grew to have a real love. We had this little chapel when you were serving. If you were over five foot ten, if you were serving Mass, you know, some of the older guys... You had to duck your head because it was a slope ceiling when you went to get the cruets and you'd be serving mass and there'd be wasps flying around your head. I don't know why there's always wasps in there, but this is low ceiling, right? So when you stood up, that wasp was right. So you're a little boy trying to serve mass, not a little boy, young teenager trying to serve mass and you're watching the, the wasp climb across the altar towards the priest. It's distracting. But it was very, uh, it had a very, um, it was very close, a very, uh, I don't know, intimate or, or intimate might be the word for it that I, I grew up a real love for the Blessed Sacrament there and for the ceremonies of the church. You know, benediction in that little space with whatever it fit, 30 people or something, you know. Uh, I grew developed a real love for it there. And like Father, I went to Mass um, with my stepfather. Thank my, Many thanks to him for that when I didn't have to. Once, so we had Mass once a month, but then one time a year we would have Mass every day for a month when the clergy would come and stay. And so we would get up at I think it was 6.30 and, you know, drive out for 7 o'clock mass half hour away and on this farm. And that's really where my vocation was fostered, I think, in that those those weekday masses, serving mass, you know, just by myself with two or three people in the chapel there, this little chapel. And uh, I just, I know that inclination was there and it stuck with me. For me, there was no question pretty much from the time I was 13 on, there was very little question about it. And Someone asked me one time, my sister-in-law asked me, well, how'd you know we want to be a priest? I was like, oh, how'd you know you wanted to get married? Or how old were you when you knew we wanted to get married? 15. How'd you know? I don't know. <laughs> so, but there's definitely that inclination. That right. said, 
it was not a clear cut, easy path. You know, I got, I hit, um, 18 is graduated high school or 19 and so, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go. And, and nothing worked out. Nothing panned out. I'm thinking here I am, I'm qualified. I wanted this for my whole life. And yet I, I couldn't make it to somewhere to study. It just a whole bunch of circumstances would be a story all its own, but I uh, ended up being 24 before I could get into the seminary before I got into the seminary. Uh, so in the meantime, I, uh, became a piano tuner, which was another very interesting profession, but, um, so it was not clear cut. And those were, those were kind of challenging. There's a lot of challenges along the way because you want to be a priest and you read about the priesthood in the books and the, and the, uh, stories and, you know, the religion books you're reading and everything, but it's like, okay, I want to be a priest, but there's no bishops in my country and, uh, no native clergy. <laughs> and, you know, it's not like such a, it's not such a clear cut thing. So and I think that'll probably come a little more as we talk. That's, that's kind of that aspect of it being the nineties. So, but I did eventually very much providentially and unexpectedly end up in the CMRI seminary in Omaha with Father Sanquist and uh, we were ordained together and the rest is history. And now you have a, a pretty growing parish, Father, in, in, in Canada, you're telling me before the show, but that's beautiful. Yeah, we have about 140 people a Sunday, I would think. We have about, I'd say 12 to 15 people at our daily mass, oftentimes more and uh, a lot of young kids. I, just, I haven't counted recently, but something like 60, 60 and under, 14 and under, 60, 14 and under. Um, and it's growing, I would say, on average, we see new people every two to three weeks right now. So it's really, uh, it's really been quite the time. Over the past two years, we've over doubled in size. So awesome. the situation and especially the situation here um, really caused people to, to start thinking. And uh, yeah, immediately after, after this, I'm heading off to talk to one of those families, an extension of one of those families who was fairly new to the parish, but now they're, they're families. So again, it's just like you're saying about the priesthood, also with the lady, it's exponential. Every person that start, comes to a true mass, they have a whole circle of people and some of those are also brought in. So That's great. And, and it's something that, that we see here in our little parish too. When, when I first came here, what's now six years ago, it was a, maybe 35 people and mostly like one family or an extended family. Um, and yeah, it's, it's doubled. It's doubled or at least doubled. And it, even in the last two years, it's the same. You, you've had two or three families now, big young families that have come over because of yeah, the, the issues with the, the Nova Soto church, they, they, they don't want to have, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to serve their people. You know, they, 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 they've left their sheep to, to wander and the, the sheep have wandered to, to us, I think in many cases. And, and thank God, I mean, thank, you know, sometimes bad situations lead, lead to good outcomes, I suppose. And, and I think that, that it's, it's a really interesting thing because I think obviously we've all had different experiences. I think father Saunders, you've had one, it, growing up it, that I think many also had, as you say, in the nineties and two thousands, even today with the, with the little, the little churches and the, the, the little parishes of 30 people, maybe one extended family. And father Sanquist and I are a little bit different that I grew up in Denver, which had a, a quite a large parish too, ever since I can remember they had maybe, I don't know, 150 or 200 people. Um, and then from there, I went to to Omaha, and 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 so the, the the smallest parish I've ever experienced was was the one I'm in now, which is pretty interesting. But but I think that that's 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 such an interesting thing that I don't think any of us can comment on. Obviously, having grown up in the '60s or '70s, that that's nothing that we can can say. But I mean, in the '90s, I, I mean, I guess it had. I mean, what, what were the struggles? I guess I mean, Father Saunders. I guess you're the good one to start. What were the struggles for for you? in your parish, you know, in, in the nineties, I guess, primarily having mass once a month. The, the biggest struggle I would say was lack of peers. That was unquestionably. So really you're talking, so we became traditional in 2000. I was nine years old and uh, very few peers. Uh, and to an extent, as, as the years went by, almost none. And, uh, you know, there was another family that were friends of ours, uh, but just circumstances kind of, you know, didn't, didn't, they, they were all girls. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was pretty much it for a lot of years. Some of the others were more distant that might have been peers. And so that was unquestionably 100% the, the hardest part was uh, I had no Catholic friends, you know, or very, very few. No one that would, that would really be a peer. You know, some people that friendships with, but only on a certain, on a certain, in a certain aspect, you know, so no one you're just going to hang out with. So I grew up with all Protestant friends, really decent people. They were homeschooled as I was. Um, so that's how we got you know, kind of. But at the same time, you're always kind of on the outside there because I was the Catholic one. 
you know, so there's a lot of things they were doing that, you know, they, they would all go off to youth group and say, well, I'm not going off the youth group for them. So that was, um, yeah, that was really, really, I'd say the biggest challenge. And that was actually one of my motivations in becoming a priest. You know, I, the main thing was I thought I had a vocation, but also I wanted to remedy that situation. I wanted to create for the next generation what we didn't have. And uh, we're trying to do that. And it's certainly there's, <laughs> certainly there's a lot more opportunity for peers here, which I'm very grateful for. You know, so that was the number one challenge for sure. And, and was there was there any challenge in terms of questioning y your position? I suppose. I mean, because I think again in the '60s and '70s, that was no one really knew. It was kind of like, Ooh, what are we doing? Let's do our best and figure out where we're going. But it, it wasn't quite the same. Was that an issue for for you guys? I was. I would say, in uh, it was definitely at issue. Um, it was never a huge disturbance for me, but it was always there. There was always questions of uh, why, or I wanted, I always wanted more and more answers all the time, you know, and Father Sanquist might be, be able to attest to me being annoying, asking questions about stuff. I don't remember you know, in the seminary first doing the same thing, but uh, you know, I, I definitely wanted answers and I often found, and I think some kids might have the same experience that um, the, the, reasons of those who had gone before me were not quite sufficient for me you know and, that, and that's that's true in any case that everybody has kind of a different threshold of how much proof they want for things and i wanted a pretty uh high bar of proof so but thankfully you know god's grace i i instead of just abandoning it i looked for it you know i, I sought it out um so but it was definitely yeah sometimes when things were really hard you were definitely thinking okay this is you know but then on the other hand, you look around at what was there, you think, well, <laughs> we definitely got the best, you know, we got the truth. So it's, you, know, you look around at what, what else was supposedly Catholic, because that was the other thing, the people who would have been my peers, that generation of people who should have been Catholic, the Novus Ordo had done their work and they weren't, right? So, so it was definitely, yeah, yeah, definitely something on the mind. And Father Sanquist, I, I mean, obviously you had a very unique situation. It's hard to ask you what your struggles were because you were in a, a big parish with a bishop. But, but I mean, what do you, did you have any? Was that something that, that was there something that was that was tough growing up? I mean, I guess for you or for your family. Like any cradle Catholic, um, I mean, there may have been some minor struggles. Personally, I don't. Um, nothing, nothing huge, but I know what can be, uh, if we're not careful for cradle Catholics, a struggle is that tend to take things for granted. And I know, for example, Father Saunders can probably agree that those who came from the Novus Ordo or those who came from Protestantism or any other religion, oftentimes converts are, can become the most knowledgeable Catholics because they they convert in their later years and they're looking they're seeking for those answers whereas cradle catholics if if we're not if we're you know uh if we're not paying too much attention uh or giving it our full attention i guess uh growing through school you know maybe just kind of sliding by not taking it as seriously that can be a real problem and and you know i was speaking you know i still get calls from people that even went to school uh, and and they're in these conversations Protestants, how do i answer this or how do i answer that and uh you know they're like you know, you know it's the real world where people have questions about faith and and you know so i think that can be um a particular uh struggle for for cradle catholics i think is just not taking that seriously or kind of taking things for granted and you know that's one thing i would encourage um cradle catholics especially to not take things for granted and realize that it it does require effort we're not just gonna expect to go out in the world and know all the answers how to you know i mean they're real answers this real life where where people are going to bring up challenging questions and and granted we're not going to know the answer right off the bat but we should do our own research and and take this seriously so that's one thing i guess um one problem or one 
issue that I think happened with with uh, cradle Catholics is maybe just taking things for granted and not applying that uh, sincere effort. I, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Father. And I think that I, I see that too, that in myself, as, again, as a cradle Catholic as well, that that I, yeah, I, I take for granted even understanding my faith. And so, you know, I'll, I'll open up a catechism, you know, basic, cate- even a children's catechism, well, you know, because, I mean, come on, I, pff, I've, I've done this before. And then it's like, oh, um, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I don't, I'm not as comfortable with it as I should be. I, it's crazy, but it's true. And it's like, I should know this and I don't. And it's really, it's shameful, honestly. And it is, it's exactly as you say, Father. It's because, because I, I grew up with it. I went to school in Omaha, for goodness sake. The bishop taught me apologetics. It's all this stuff that I'm, I, I kind of walk around, you know, with a swagger in my head. And then I don't even know, you know, basic catechism because I've forgotten it, you know, and I think that, that that's a, that's such a good point. Mm-hmm. And, and, and also, I think it's such a good point that that cradle Catholics need to I think I, this is my opinion. I, I think cradle Catholics need to be more active and really, really live their faith and try to to bring others to the faith as well. That I think mm-hmm. I, I had to show the other on, on Saturday with these three young guys who are just they blew my mind how smart they were and how well read they were. And they weren't just quoting encyclicals. They were quoting commentaries on encyclicals. And they're all converts. They're all converts. None of them were cradle traditionals. They're all converts to the faith. And that just blew me away. And I'm sitting over here like a, like a little idiot. Like, oh, that's that's nice. <laughs> Sounds like a nice encyclical. I, I didn't know any of that stuff. And, and, and you're, it's, you're, it's such a good point, Father Sanquist, that 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 is such a danger. I think you're, 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 you couldn't be more right. And I think that anyone watching this, Go and pick up a catechism because, because, or an encyclical. I mean, go go and read from the true popes and from the teachings of the church because we know a lot less than we should. Something mm-hmm. in that regard that always sticks with me was a, a bishop said to me one time, if you stop studying, you will forget even the most basic catechism. He said, he's talking about priests. He said, if priests stop studying, they will forget even the most basic catechism. So it's... It makes sense. Yeah. 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 Even, as you say, even, even for priests who all, all the time are, are, are that that's like your life, but yeah, I mean, it, so okay, seven year olds ask some of the hardest questions. <laughs> I you know, Father St. Chris has the same experience, but sometimes kids, they put you to the test. They, yeah. but, well, they have that simple view of, of the world, right. And of the faith that, that, mm-hmm. and I think that, that I talk about a whole nother topic, but I mean, you know, you get so bogged down in these, the politics of, 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 the faith and not the faith, but the politics of the church, I suppose, or what's going on or, or, you know, this, that, and the other, and then you're right. And then the, the basics really get swept under the rug and the basics in the end are, are all, they're not all that matters, but they're, they're the most important thing. Right. And that, that's, that's, that's definitely true. And, and I think that, yeah, I think before, before we go, I think what we also wanted to talk about was, I don't know if you as priests deal with this. You, you probably do the, the strange looks. You, do, do, do you ever have people come up to you and be like, you know, uh, you know, wh- you're wearing a, a collar. You know, what, what's what's that about? I, I don't know if that's do, do you have people approach you thinking that I don't I don't know how to phrase it, that, that, that you're, you are something strange, I suppose, or something un- abnormal. I don't know if all the same question, maybe I'll ask you first. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um... Sometimes it happens in in sprees. Like there was one time on one weekend, uh, I think I got three different comments. One was all from like, like I go to a subway, another one was station or whatever, a grocery store. But uh, the the the, uh, the workers there, it was one comment after another. I mean, in these different places, one was like, "What are you all schnazzied up for?" Or or uh, you. you going out to some special event or it's like they have most of them some of them have an idea that the collar represents a priest or whatever but some of them it seems blue they just you know see somebody dressed up all fancy or um but and then uh get that quite often though sometimes i walk into a gas station and somebody will be like hey father or hey padre how's it going and you know you know sometimes it's good sometimes um sometimes it's interesting but but yes you do get a lot of yourself uh quite regularly get some compliment or some comment uh or other is that the same for you father saunders less so for me uh if anything i get kind of 
uh, confused looks or just kind of like uh, you know, people because it's um, religion in general is much, much less present here than in Omaha, for example. Uh, very, very much so. Um, so definitely, definitely people look at you everywhere you go. Eventually you stop paying attention to it. I think I suppose they still do, but I don't know. Uh, it's not, it's not as much as when you're with the nuns, when you're with the nuns everywhere, <laughs> they, they really, you know, but, um, I, I don't get too much reaction. Definitely people notice, uh, and similar thing. Occasionally you get into, if you have occasion to get in conversations with people, they're always interesting as I think it was Chesterton maybe that said that people are never indifferent about Catholic priests. They might hate them or they might love them, but no one's ever just like, oh yeah, Catholic priests, whatever. You know, so if they have an idea of what you are, there's definitely an interest there, I find. So if you actually get in the conversation, I, I'll tell people when I was first ordained, I was driving up from Michigan, I was living in Michigan, driving up here to the parish for my uh, parish mass here on the weekends. And I would get in on Friday night. And it's like, okay, what do you eat on Friday night at 11 o'clock? So Subway. Subway was my thing. And uh young guy working in Subway there. And by the time I got to the end, 11 o'clock at night, he was like 18, 19, something like that. And get to the end of ordering your sub and we're talking about the Church of Satan. And I'm thinking, man, I'm just ordering a sub. Like it's 11 o'clock on Friday night, you know? <laughs> but but so you get into some interesting conversations. But then you also have those really heartening times where, uh, you know, people had never met you before, no clue who you are or whatever. And uh, when they see you, they light up. You know, so hey father yeah you know, it's like wow that's that's something that's something special it doesn't happen very often here in canada in ontario but uh it's occasionally it's just this morning you're walking down the street and because I, I have a sick call that's close enough that i can walk to it and the guy oh good morning father and then uh, he ended up stopping and talking to me but um yeah so you get some good ones mostly in different ones or curious ones here but usually people find you somewhat fascinating i would say yeah. You don't fit that you know you're you're definitely not normal sure. in the sense of average <laughs> well and i i had a i had a podcast a couple months ago about um fashion w women's fashion and dress dressing modestly etc and one of the girls said that we were talking about why girls should wear skirts and dresses rather than pants and, and, and it was an interesting conversation and and one of them i asked one of them you know why don't you, i don't understand why don't you just wear them i mean i mean why not wear a skirt or a dress because it looks better because because every, they all admitted it, it looks better so it, it it's not the looks and, and one of them said well it's because people always you know people look at us differently and think think kind of it's kind of strange right and then they say stuff about us and like oh okay you know what do they say is it well, they always say how nice it looks and stuff. <laughs> yeah, so they, so they all admit it. They always get compliments. Everyone always says how great they look. You know, they, they people appreciate them wearing it. You know, and, and and I think that's a really an interesting thought because it's like, okay, I think we 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 think that we are being looked at because we're different, which is true, but it's not in a bad way. I, I think people really appreciate it if you dress nicely, especially modestly. And people actually actually respect that because they know that you respect yourself. And again, that's a whole nother topic. But but I think that I, I guess I'd ask you you too. I don't even how do I even ask it? It's, it's a strange question to ask. But I guess that the point is when people hear the word state of a contest, most people think it's kind of a strange thing, right? They, they think it's kind of this I, cult is too extreme. It's not a cult. I don't think people think it's a cult, but they think it's kind of this weird group. They think it's a a strange kind of outshoot of Catholicism that have weird old fashioned beliefs. Is that something that you, either of you have, have faced and had to, I don't know, I, I mean, try to explain otherwise, or is it not really an issue when you, when you're meeting with somebody? Go ahead, Father Sanquist. <laughs> Sorry. I should have asked. <laughs> um, I suppose me having the smaller missions and I really don't have too much public exposure other than, than, uh, going to my missions and back. I'm pretty, you know, uh, I'm not in a big city. I'm, I'm out here in Persia, Iowa, but I would say by and large, I just tell people we're Catholic and, you know, I think it, it takes a long time for people to come to that conclusion because that's such a core issue with the Catholic faith is that, you know, allegiance to the Pope or that obedience to the Pope. And so getting people to get there is not, uh, 
not very easy. And I've found over conversations, people that know we have the Latin mass, just from experience, uh, I've told them right off the bat, you know, that, that you know, we're state of the contest. We don't. Uh, and, and I've realized that, that every time I do that, they don't show up for mass. They, I don't know. It's almost, I, I mean, maybe it's not explained properly, or I think, honestly, I, I think it's just hard for people to come to that. It takes time. And so my humble opinion is to kind of avail them of the, the sacraments, the means of grace. I mean, rather let them come to mass. And, and it's, I mean, if they're novice ordo, obviously they're in good faith uh, and try to slowly lead them there i think you know if we just go full force right off the bat a lot of times that pushes people away i have an experience um just from phone calls from my mission for example uh you know it, they'll they'll call they're interested but i think i give too much to start off and that it kind of maybe in their mind think oh this is some sort of cult and then they don't end up coming so that that's just a, I guess the speculation, but that's, you know, kind of my thoughts there. Yeah, I think, I think that definitely um, you, it, it's seen as something fringe or it depends too. It depends a lot on who you're interacting with. Like if you, if you have the opportunity to explain it to Protestants, they get it right away. You're like, okay, here's Francis worshiping Pacamama. And they're like, oh, well, that's not Christian. They're like, okay, done deal. You know, they're like, yeah, what do you guys do? It makes sense. Uh, sometimes, you know, but that's not too often you get that exposure either. But, but, uh, so it depends a lot, you know, if you're talking to, um, like indult crowds, sometimes they're already aware and they've been, they have a bit of an ingrained hostility. So it really depends, I think, who you're interacting with. But I think that, you know, what father was saying in the vein of, you know, we're Catholic. And I know that's something that people that really appreciate, you know, one guy who came from the SSPX. He's like, you know, I really like just coming to Mass and hearing about the Catholic faith. Because I don't preach about the Novus Ordo often. Very, more recently, recently, or more often recently, because we have so many new people. They have to make sure they're informed and educated on these things. Uh, but, you know, that was one thing that they really valued is like, oh, I don't have to go to, go to church and hear sermons about what's going on in Rome and what's this and that. And, you know, you just, we come and you talk about faith and morals and the Catholic religion. And so... I think if people can come from that perspective of we're Catholic, therefore we're set of the contest rather than we are set of the mm -hmm. contests, you know, because really set of the contism, you know, Mario Dirksen said in a recent talk, you know, it's not really a proper ism. It's, it's just an application of Catholicism to the situation in the world. And so I think there is a, a bit of a danger there of you know, mm -hmm. saying, well, even labeling yourselves in that way. But uh, so you do get that reaction. I find that if people actually get a chance to meet you, that goes a long way. I think that there's a definitely a very strong bias there. I would say, especially on the part of family members of people who are sort of the contest. But if they actually get a chance to meet our clergy and be like, "Hey, these people are human," like you know, they have that, senses of humor, and they're not they're not off their rockers, you know. I'm glad and, you say that, Father. That that that's exactly what I look for, or not the only thing, but part of what I want for in these podcasts. I mean, and to just show. I mean, we're normal people. I, I, and again, Father Sanquist was, was swinging on a swinging on a on a branch and you know breaking his arm when he should have been listening to me. And I, but and I know Father Sanquist would would probably rather be outside playing soccer right now in seventy degree weather. But but he he unfortunately promised he'd do this podcast. You know, so, and, and you know, and I think I love that. And Father Saunders and I, we, we used to when you were in the seminary, I'd, I'd give you a hard time about you know being Canadian, and and you'd you, you'd. you'd it hit me back about being American. I, it, I just think that's that's something that so many people don't get to see. And I, that's such a good point that that you're you're human, but in a good way. I, I mean, we are we are Catholic. We're, we're, we're normal people. We we do the same things. We like sports and we you know playing outside. We like singing. You know, Father Sinkwa says we like we like the we love God. I mean, and I think that that's so important that, that people they, they get the word state of a contism and then they delve into all of these different things, you know, if it's, if it's the, the, even the took consecrations and all of these things, which is really important, obviously. But, but the, first of all, I'm sure, of course you both would agree that we do it all for God, right? I mean, all you, you, the whole purpose, I know for sure from the same right. And I think of the other groups too, of course, is to lead souls to heaven. 
And, and, and I think that's, that's what people need to see your, your normal humans leading, leading, trying to your best doing, doing a, a job, right. To try to lead souls to heaven. And I think that's, that's, I hope more people can see that. Yeah. I mean, I don't like, I like Sadevikantism insofar as the truth, but the part of the rest of it goes, it's no fun at all. I mean, you know, there's not a single one of our priests that wants, wants this to be the circumstance we're in. You know, it's and, a nightmare. And, Right. Yeah, especially for the clergy. It's, it leads to so many difficult complications not having a Pope. We all want one so much. You know, instead of the contisms, it's not like we're looking to the other on our own. We want to be, you know, it's just like, no, it's the only conclusion, the only way we can stay Catholic. And yeah, we're just, you know, we come from you know, families where well, lots of my brothers are tradesmen, you know, people that go to the university. My sister works for the UN. You know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're humans out in the world with all this, this wide plethora of people you know when you're related to and just like everybody else and that's where i think personal exposure and unfortunately sometimes people's first introduction to uh traditional catholicism or civicantism can be that person who is hyper fixated on some non-essential question that just likes to make a beeline for a new parishioner and you know talk to them about something that they really don't need to hear about at all you know so um but that's where in time people see through that i think and they that was when I went to the CMRI. So I was not very familiar with the CMRI. Um, when I went to the CMRI seminary, I wasn't hundred percent settled in my mind on it. And uh, two things made me stay there and convince me this is where I need to be. One was the devotion to doctrine I saw in their teachers, that they teach them what the Catholic church taught. And that was it. That's all, that was all they were interested in teaching, no opinions, etc. cetera. Um, and that the people were happy. That was to me, those were the two things that everybody I encountered was happy. Not all the time, but generally speaking, everyone was happy. And that was a very, very important thing for me to see. And that was one of the most convincing elements that what was going on there to me was right. And you had that combination between uncompromising Catholic doctrine, but joyful, normal people. Even though even though Omaha is is not the most normal places, I'm sure Father <laughs> Sanquist would agree that Omaha is... It's pure chaos. It's pure chaos, but it's a beautiful chaos. Anyone who's been there will will understand that it is. It, it's the craziest place you'll ever be. But it's a it, it's in a good way. It, it's hard to describe, but it's there's no place like it. And it's something too that I, I so I cannot recommend enough for anyone who can to go there for a holy week or especially for an ordination because it's it'll change your life. I, I really mean that. I mean it's especially for people from small parishes. I just can't recommend it enough. Don't save your vacation. Don't don't go to Cancun or wherever. Go to Omaha for an ordination because it really is. It will spiritually change you because just to have to see all the priests and all the nuns and in and, and the ceremonies and the the, the proper liturgy and the, the choir. It's it's incredible. It it really is. I I think it will change your life. And I think that I don't know when that when are the next ordinations. I think they're coming up in in May. Is that right? No, well, we'll have no, 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 no priestly ordinations, but no sling. Maybe by next May, we'll have six priests, but uh, there'll be six, six subdeacons this May. So right now, wow. including the religious, there are a total of uh, 18 seminarians, I believe. Um, and uh, uh, not a single major in major order in may may, may, may 11 to be six sub yes and god willing in december they'll become the next may of 2023 uh god willing as, as much as many as six uh, ordained to the priest and sometimes it happens we get transfers um you know uh and so it could be more but not likely um but yeah, God willing, to be six priests next May, and usually it's held on May eleventh. But we're not going to set the date that far in advance. So. That's great, and I think that that's a great place to end. I know Father Saunders has to run and go, 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 convert some, some more, some more people. Yeah, that, that's try. Right. Yeah. God it's, it's does the converting. That, that this is true. This is true, and, and I hope that everyone listening will say a prayer for for Father Saunders and Father Sanquist, and that they continue in their good work and. As always, the priests need more prayers than anybody else. They 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 have a hard job, and uh, the, the devil is always after them. So never forget to pray for a priest. Never forget to pray for vocations. And please, if you can, um, I'm going to attach a link to the seminary 
Um, so if you want to donate to the modern day seminary, I know they can always use it. They they're outgrowing their, their brand new building as far as I've heard. So, um, I think they, they, they could always we got use triple bunks. donations. So. <laughs> triple bunks in a seminary that I, I, we need to help them out guys. Let, let's, let's, um, let's get them at least only into double bunks here in the next few years that would be good. At, at the seminary. That would be good. It's always a plus. And, and not not having to share, Father was saying, what, 17 people in one one tiny little common area. That sounds uh, sounds like a, a no, no fist fights yet, I hope, Father, I guess. I guess in a seminary, I guess that that, that that's hopefully not going to happen. But uh, close quarters, that's. Yes. Yeah. Hey, it's a good it's a good we do place that to out learn, I guess. <laughs> that's good. good place to learn humility, I suppose, and all sorts of other things. But but anyway, I, I really appreciate it for, for both of you coming on, Father Saunders, Father Sanquist. I'd love to do it again sometime. Um, I have I have I have yeah. I, I, big ideas coming up for, sure. for, for priests to come on the show, and I hope that um maybe you two can can be part of that, and we'll talk after the recording about that. Um, but anyway, please pray for these two good priests and Father Saunders, Father Sanquist. Thanks so much, and until next time, God bless. Thank you. Thank you for having us.